Cognitive dissonance. Sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong. When they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable, called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with the core belief. The core belief in this example is that the thylacine is extinct. This is the actual thylacine extinction paper by Dr. Michael Archer from 1978. There's several flaws in this extinction paper. It is opinion based and not a peer reviewed publication. The carbon dating used on the Mundrabilla specimen was flawed and had exposure from the Maralinga tests. New evidence pushes the dingo's arrival in Australia out to around 10,000 years. So he's justifying the arrival of the dingo as part of the extinction. Archer's own evidence of a juvenile thylacine humerus found in a cave deposit is no older than 80 years. Well, that contradicts the assumed mainland extinction of three to 4,000 years and is actually proof of breeding on the mainland. It is well documented that dogs are terrified of thylacines and do not compete with them in the wild for game or for habitat, especially domestic dogs. There are no wild packs of dogs in Tasmania. Stephen Smith's report demonstrates the continued sightings of thylacine in Tasmania despite this evidence being largely ignored by Archer. He's not interested in any sightings evidence, but here he is saying that there's not enough sightings in former areas to suggest that they are there. But there are, and there's many, many sightings on the mainland as well. Archer's assumptions regarding behaviour of thylacines is not supported by any behavioural studies by him at all to justify his opinion. He basically has ignored the behaviour of nearly all major predators in his assumptions. And sightings continue to this day all over Tasmania in every former corner of their known range. Even the official online Thylacine Museum claims they are not extinct but critically endangered. And if you go to their website and have a look at the opening page, it clearly states, Today the Thylacine is listed as extinct by the World Wildlife Fund and International Union for the Conservation of Nature. However, there is sufficient evidence in the form of sightings reports, many from highly respected sources, to suggest that the extinction event may not yet have taken place. Therefore, throughout the museum, the species is viewed as extant, albeit critically endangered. So I'm here with Mark out at the beach, and we've found a Bennett wallaby, Bennett's wallaby's prints here, where it's getting chased, and a really big, large, five-toed beast is chasing it. So we've got our fifth digit here, that's a uh, front right, then we've got a rear foot with that twist, the other rear foot. Then we've got the front left, there's the fifth digit there, front right, fifth digit there. You know, like how much more obvious does it have to get when you've got these large five-toed prints, splayed toes, long claws, sausage-like digits, Belting along in a beach in the middle of nowhere, northeast Tasmania, chasing a Bennett's wallaby. Here's another one with the fifth digit right here. Look at this. He's a fresh. He's only a day or two old from the last tide. I'm not sure when the last high tide was, which for Mark was, but less than 48 hours old. These prints probably t less than 24 hours old. Look at this one. I'm going to plaster cast some of these. Mark's having a good time and we'll uh, see what we can come up with. So quite a few years ago now, back in the 90s I think it was, Barbara Triggs produced a book called Tracks, Scats and Other Traces, which was basically about footprints and scats of animals that are native to Australia so people could identify them when they're out in the field. It's a great little book, very handy for people that do a lot of bushwalking. 
In there, Barbara had some sketches of what she believed thylacine feet looked like. Now, these sketches were based on the only reference she had, which was the deceased juvenile footprints from the Melbourne Zoo from the 1920s. Now, this is the actual deceased print cast that I'm talking about here in this photograph. As you can see, they have that line going through the middle on both sides of the planter pad, um, which gives it the effect that it might have three planter pads. It does have only a singular planter pad. Now, this line is only really obvious on deceased specimens and not really obvious on a living specimen. This fella here, Stanley Morley, back about 10 years ago, was running around online with these print casts of what he claimed to be thylacine prints, which look remarkably like Barbara Triggs's um, sketches from her book, oddly enough. Here we have the very print cast in Rob Breedle's The Barefoot Bushman Devil's Island documentary from years ago. Now, in that documentary, Stanley says he's going to protect the thylacine and he's going to destroy these prints so nobody sees them and nobody knows what a thylacine's footprint looks like and it'll keep the thylacine safe. Now, this is a photo of Nick Mooney holding one of Stanley's prints. When I met Nick Mooney in 2021 and chatted to him about footprints, etc., he told me in his own words that he would be a bit cautious about that print in particular and not take it too seriously because... I think he doubted um, the integrity of the print. Now, here we have Stanley in that documentary actually destroying the last prints, the last pasta cast, to protect the thylacine. But then in November 2021, Stanley turned up at a friend of mine's pub and gave this to her as a gift. It's one of Stanley's dodgy-looking prints. So here I am with one of Stanley Morley, a.k.a. Rusty Hyena's famous fake prints that were all destroyed, apparently. And here's one kicking around still. Now, this is a living female thylacine adult in a zoo lying on her side. You can quite clearly see the surface of her planter pad. You can see where the fifth digit is positioned. If you look at the planter pad on a living animal, it does not have those lines so definitively running through it. When they're dead and they're a bit shriveled up, sure, those lines become more prominent and obvious. But we're not looking for a dead thylacine running around the bush. We're looking for a living thylacine running around the bush. Sadly, Barbara's f sketches from her book do not give clear representation of what a living animal's foot is going to look like. Now, don't forget, they've got no webbing between their toes. So when they run, their toes splay outwards, wide apart. Here we have a wet specimen. And again, you can see that plump planter pad and how far back that fifth digit is set. This is the Houghton Howler print from Tea Tree Gully in South Australia from 2016. Biggest thing I ever did see. Nick Mooney swears black and blue that it's too big to be a thylacine, but we have many reports of very large thylacines throughout history. Some of them up to 55 kilos. Big adult male animals. They're going to have big feet. Here we have Reginald Pocock's sketch, which is an excellent display of how the toes spread outwards on a thylacine. Sadly... He's dealing with a dead animal again, and you can see that definitive line creasing in the planter pad. But it's not the true representation of what a living animal's foot like looks like. Now, I don't know about you, but that plaster cast is a dead ringer for Reginald's drawings. Now, when I went to the museum in 2021, I specifically asked to see those 10 plaster casts from Eric Geiler from North north west tasmania in 1962 he was adamant they were thylacine casts when i asked why i wasn't being shown those prints nick mooney said to me and i quote oh they're not available today sorry and it doesn't matter because they're only dog prints anyway unquote that's what nick said to me dr guyler 
you know, who studied thylacines for 30, 40 years, must have got it wrong then, I guess, hey? Here we have um, Eric Gould's picture that he presented to the Zoological Society of the Queensland Tiger. Mr. Hole's very good drawing. Here we have a footprint from South Australia 2018. Looks remarkably like Mr. Hull's drawing. Here we have another one. Same area, uh, different location. Now here's the thyla brick. This brick was confirmed to be a genuine thylacine's footprint impression by Catherine Medlock a few years back. They did get this brick out for me to see when I was there in 2021. I took a whole heap of plaster casts along and every one of them, Nick said, was a large dog and it was too big to be a thylacine. So last year, I think it was, or late the year before, 2022, a guy got in touch with me, I know a friend of mine, and um, he had found a video from 1984 that was made by a New Zealand production company, for, I presume for New Zealand TV, about uh, thylacines, because the uh, extinction was coming up, it was still a endangered species, um, so there was a bit of publicity. Hans Narding sighting had been released. 1984 was a busy, busy year in thylacine world. Anyway, um, there's an interview here with Nick Mooney from 1984 explaining what a thylacine foot looks like. Um, take from it what you will. I think Nick's theory on feet is wrong. Um, Nick's never produced a scientific paper that's been peer-reviewed about his theory on what a thylacine's footprint looks like. I don't know why Nick has to go through his convoluted explanation of what a thylacine print looks like when the museum has many examples in their coffers that people have presented of thylacine prints. Now, in this documentary in particular, it's a bit weird. Nick presents a five-toed, large thylacine footprint. Now, when I went and saw him in 2021, he never showed me that five-toed print that he got excited about in 1984. Maybe he forgot on the day. Who knows? Anyway, he compares it to a dog print, which he also says is quite large. And when you look at them, they're about the same size and they are quite large. Yet he keeps saying these days that it, everything I've found is just too big to be a thylacine. Even though there was thylacine shot that were up to six feet long and weighing over 50 kilograms. These would have been your big alpha males in family areas um, within the territory. And they would have been old old alpha males in the family territory of historic you know distributions so there would have been quite a few of these large adult males shot or trapped for their furs over the years that are being overlooked nick also goes to great length to explain his theory on how he came to the conclusion of how big a thylacine's footprint gets basically he took a dead animal and which was a taxidermied thylacine from a museum and let me tell you they never bother with the feet on taxidermies because they don't get seen i've looked at a few taxidermies and nearly all of them have terrible shriveled up feet and they are no by no means a guide um, to how big those feet were when the animal was alive that's for certain anyway nick goes through his theory on how he believes a thylacine's foot is going to look as far as size goes um, and it's all based on a dehydrated devil's foot versus a live devil's foot and he's allowed 15% shrinkage so anything above that 15% Nick's going to turn around and say is not a thylacine but I disagree with Nick respectfully I think he's completely and utterly wrong either accidentally or because he's just so used to the thylacine being extinct in his opinion maybe he's overlooking some um, important evidence here you decide footprints not unlike the claws of a tiger were reported in the sand in 1642 when the dutch explorer abel tesman discovered an island southeast of mainland australia he called it van diemen's land but it was later renamed Tasmania in his honour. Sightings, footprints, hair and droppings have all been produced as evidence. But is a footprint sufficient proof? Generally, footprints are few and far between, even uh, footprints that might be thylacine. And 
the quality is generally just not up to what you'd require to make a decision on it. And they're very easy to hoax, of course. And as far as hair goes, um, yes, we can certainly analyse the hair, but that too is, is not terribly hard to hoax. There are many thylacine skins around, and it's not difficult for someone to uh, retrieve some hair, and I have to think of that as well. In fact, the nearest I've seen to what might be a thylacine is uh, this, this footprint. It has characteristics uh, that, that suit. We have five toes, and there's no way I can um, construe this to have four toes plus some sort of overriding footprint or a stick or a stone. I think there's five toes here and a very big pad, not of a dog shape. And it's, compared to a dog footprint, it's quite different. Um, so this one makes me very nervous. Uh, the only thing it may be is a, a wombat on very hard ground, but there are certain parts of it, namely the claws, which don't, don't suit wombat. And it... Nick's correct. It would be very difficult to confuse a wombat with a dog or a thylacine. Their toe alignment and their plantar pads are completely different. Interesting way I found of trying to find the size is by comparing a dehydrated Tasmanian devil foot with a fresh devil foot of the same size and by that you can calculate the shrinkage factor and, and I applied that to museum skins of thylacine. We have a shrunken foot on a skin and by expanding the same amount about 15% in, in area, not as much as you'd imagine, we can have a size of what a thylacine foot should be. Remember a thylacine is not that heavy, it, uh, most of them are only 20-25 kilograms, a very large one 30 kilograms, so um, they're no bigger than a, a wombat foot. They're not nowhere as large as this dog's foot. This is off a very large dog, 40-45 kilograms. So most people are bringing in very big prints and they're not, not um, thylacine. Just to add a little bit more information to this whole debate about how big a thylacine's foot gets. Now, in 1953 or 56, I can't remember, it was one, I think it was 53, my old neighbour, Bert Ma, happened to be living out near Springfield. Now, he was a rabbit trapper. He was living off of the fur trade. He was very poor. He lived in a humpy out in the bush with his wife and kids. Um, but he was out there. Anyway, something was stealing his rabbits from his traps. So he slightly changed the way he was setting his traps. He found some prints. Um, and he wasn't too sure what it was. Now, Bert wasn't a highly educated man. You've got to remember, it was very remote communities back in those days in the country in Tassie. And so he couldn't afford a lot for it as far as education goes. So he didn't actually know what a thylacine was. Um, anyway, <clears throat> Bert went and checked his traps. There was a juvenile thylacine in there or a smallish one. He didn't know what it was. He clubbed it. He scun it. He pinned it out ended up going to the barbers and having a chat to the, the barber about it. The barber then rang up the radio station. The radio station had Bert in there or on the phone, I'm not sure, and interviewed him about it. Um, there was a bit of a fuss caused by it all. Anyway, not long after that, Bert told me personally uh, in 2012 that he got a visit by the men in black. And that was the way he described it. He said some men in a black Ford custom line in dark suits with fedora hats came to visit him they took the skin off him they've told him he's killed a native hyena and they're protected and he could get in a lot of trouble and that if he told anyone about it any further and kept making noise that they could actually take all of his kids off of him and put him in a home because he was living in pretty poor conditions Bert panicked like anyone would back in those days shut his mouth and didn't say much about it for a very long time, up until like the 1990s, I think, he finally came out publicly about what had happened. I saw Bert in uh, 2012 at my garage sale, and he told me unequivocally that it was a thylacine, and that they took it off him to cover it up, because they were gearing up for a lot of forestries back then, and they didn't want this getting in the way of it. That was Bert's own opinion. Bert was my neighbour in South Mount Cameron. Sadly, he passed away in uh, 2017. I think it was January or February. Um, he was a real character. He was a musician. He was a singer and a, and a guitarist. And he was a, he was a funny guy. Um, so he's...
definitely going to be missed. But he absolutely was adamant about what he'd um, what he'd trapped, what he'd killed, and what he'd scun. He had no idea what it was, and that they had basically wanted to cover it up. And if you have a look here about this uh, news clipping that we've got here clearly states in there that traces of Tasmanian tigers have been found in the Kaku district in the past week. Some footprints measured five inches in length and width. Five inches. That's 125 millimetres for all of those of you that only know metric. 1950s. So I'm saying a large adult male was in the area, was probably one of his juveniles, that got trapped by Bert and got clubbed and met its fate. But I don't doubt Bert's uh, testimony for a moment. And uh, here it is, a documented report of thylacine prints measuring five inches in length and width. Every animal tends to have a characteristic gait. And uh, so we had to try and decide what the thylacine one was. And the old timers description of it being like a trotting horse uh, doesn't make sense. There's no other marsupials or anything like that. But that may be uh, a gait for fast moving. But to study the normal gait they'd have, what we did was uh, develop the old roll of black and white film, frame by frame, so we could uh, reconstruct the pattern of walking. By establishing exactly where the thylacine placed all four feet when moving, it's possible to build up an accurate picture of what a complete series of its tracks would look like. Each stride made by an animal is reflected in the positioning and distance between the footprints it leaves. As well as the shape of the prints themselves, the pattern of the tracks is extremely useful in helping to determine what animal makes them. What nicks that those old timers had horses. They knew footfall patterns. They could tell a trot from a canter or a gallop. These people were people of the land and they had good animal husbandry skills. They knew what they were talking about. Now here's an interesting article here. A lot of people think that it's all crazy, this talk of a conspiracy theory, but here's an article from January 30th, 1995, where it quotes uh, officials from the Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife Service saying that they would actually cover up any proof. If the sighting was confirmed, the animal's existence and location would be concealed, Mr. Mooney said. Now, I'm not calling Nick a liar, by no means, but it would sound as though they're trying to protect the animal by not acknowledging that it exists, I suppose. Here's some photos of an official kit that was handed out to rangers back in the 80s if they would find any thylacine evidence. And the closing statement in there is... If a Tasmanian tiger you should find, you'll know by the stripes on his behind. Approach him politely, be very kind, and ask him if he'd really mind. Before you tell, do stop and think. Perhaps he'd rather stay extinct. So, take from that what you will, but it would seem as though to me that there's a little bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink thing going on there where they would rather the animal be um, extinct than extant and you know they may have to do something to protect its habitat god forbid you just never know but anyway that's you know the official kit that was handed out to rangers those photos are from the hobart, hobart museum um and i think that was put out by nick mooney and there right where he remembered was the hut and tears came into his eyes he looked at the hut, we went inside, there were the wooden boards on the sides of the hut where he and his father and his brother had slept at night. And he told me, as it all was flooding back in memories, he said, I remember the thylacines going around the hut, wondering what was inside. And he said, they made sounds like, yip, yip, yip. It, all of these are parts of his life, what he remembers. Ah, oh, yipping, Mr. Archer. We've got lots of recordings of yipping. I thought you said there was only sightings evidence.
I think the global obsession with thylacines goes into this zone, fascinating zone, of cryptozoology. Um, we find people on every continent have imagined very strange creatures like Loch Ness Monster or like Yetis and things, and they've grabbed them and they want to believe they actually exist. Um, in the case of the thylacine, there's no question about it. We know it existed. The argument is whether it still exists. So those same people who want Yetis to be alive and the Loch Ness Monster to do his swimming in that loch in Scotland want the thylacine to be alive. These cryptozoologists get to be extremely serious, devoting their whole lives to the search for any evidence that would convince someone else that it's still here. So there you have it, folks. Take it or leave it. That's just some of the facts that I've learned about thylacine feet and... Um, the narrators of the thylacine extinction narrative and how they keep maintaining their position without really budging regardless of how much evidence keeps coming in take it or leave it i believe that there is something that's just not right about that we seem to be missing the scientific side of science where we examine all the evidence we don't just stand there and say that everybody's you know seeing ufos or yowies or loch ness monsters that's just an arrogant pile of crap that is not an open-minded scientist that's actually more like a cultist really because he's in a cult of absolute denial that there's anything other than his word remember it was only his word that was in that extinction paper there was no facts it was just one man's opinion the same man who now thinks we should be cloning it. What a coincidence.